In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be to me a rock of refuge to which I may continually come. You have given the command to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Rescue me, O my God, from the hand of the wicked, from the grasp of the unjust and cruel man. For you, O Lord, are my hope, my trust, O Lord, from my youth. Upon you I have leaned from before my birth. You are he who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually of you. I have been as a portent to many, but you are my strong refuge. My mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. Do not cast me off in the time of old age. Forsake me not when my strength is spent. For my enemies speak concerning me. Those who watch for my life consult together and say, God has forsaken him. Pursue and seize him, for there is none to deliver him. O God, be not far from me. O my God, make haste to help me. May my accusers be put to shame and consumed with scorn and disgrace. May they be covered who seek my hurt. But I will hope continually and will praise you yet more and more. My mouth will tell of your righteous acts and of your deeds of salvation all the day, for their number is past my knowledge. With the mighty deeds of the Lord God, I will come. I will remind them of your righteousness, yours alone. O God, from my youth you have taught me, and I still proclaim your wondrous deeds. So even to old age and gray hairs, O God, do not forsake me until I proclaim your might to another generation, your power to all those who come. Your righteousness, O God, reaches the high heavens. You who have done great things, O God, who is like you? You have made me see many troubles and calamities. You who have made me see many troubles and calamities will revive me again. From the depths of the earth, you will bring me up again. You will increase my greatness and comfort me again. I will also praise you with the harp for your faithfulness, O my God. I will sing praises to you with the lyre, O Holy One of Israel. My lips will shout for joy when I sing praises to you, my soul also which you have redeemed, and my tongue will talk of your righteous help all the day long. For they have been put to shame and disappointed who sought to do me hurt. Amen. This is God's word this evening. And to you, Heavenly Father, we do uh, turn in uh, prayer this evening. How grateful we are to you uh, for evening worship on the, on the Lord's day. And we thank you that we gather with and not strangers, but we gather with brothers and sisters in Christ to look to you, our Heavenly Father. And uh, we do come with that sense of uh, expectancy and anticipation. We come uh, to your word, Lord, and, and uh, we do ask that you would speak to us. Uh, often we're so stubborn uh, of heart, Lord, soften us, give us, grant us ears to hear uh, from you. And please, Lord God, uh, uh, give us what is necessary in your sight uh, through your word and by your Holy Spirit. And we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so you and I, living in the Western world in the 21st century, we live, don't we, at a time of great awareness of uh, people's rights. We hear an awful lot about rights in the modern uh, day, whether it be to do with uh, basic human rights or whether it be to do with uh, race or sexuality or gender. As we look around us in the Western world, we see people everywhere up in arms, battling, striving, fighting for uh, any number of different rights. In amongst that, uh, one area of injustice that seems almost entirely overlooked 
uh, centers around age. Uh, ageism is, as uh, somebody has said before me, ageism is the last seemingly socially acceptable prejudice. And I think we can recognize that if we look at our society. Uh, so much is set up for the young person, isn't it? With very often, in Britain today, very often the older person uh, marginalized, left to the side. If we can think back to COVID, what happened in the pandemic? I think what happened, that uh, the reality is that older people were viewed by many as being acceptable collateral damage. So in Britain today, uh, old age is something, first of all, it's something to be denied, isn't it? Uh, 50 suddenly becomes the new 40. Uh, and so it's something to be denied, old age, but there's an element that's worse than that uh, because for a lot of people, old age is something uh, to be despised. Well, what about our God and what about his word? Does the Bible similarly marginalize older people? Well, this evening we, we come to the psalm. I'm going to say with a certain degree of confidence that tonight we come to a Davidic psalm. Uh, despite the fact that it is not ascribed, this psalm does seem to be uh, linked to Psalm 70 of David. And the critical thing that we need to get our heads around is the fact that the psalmist is writing from the perspective of advancing years and old age. I'm sure you noticed that in the reading. Did you? Did you? You must have noticed that he speaks about his gray hairs. And you must have noticed, I'm sure, he speaks about old age. He looks back a number of times. He looks back into the distance. He looks back uh, to his youth. So although tonight... I do want to say that there is application in this psalm for the young people. So you do not get to switch off uh, tonight if you're young. And though there is an awful lot of relevance to those of us in here tonight of any age who are quite simply weary in the Christian walk, though there's relevance for us too, this material this evening in Psalm 71 is particularly pertinent for those we might want to class as a veteran, a veteran believer, or an elderly saint. And the outline of this evening's sermon couldn't be any more straightforward or simple. We will look at this in two sections tonight, this psalm, in two sections. Um, we'll think, first of all, about the situation of this elderly saint, the situation. You might even want to think about it as the predicament, but the situation of the elderly saint, and then, again, the numbers are letting us down, aren't they? I don't know who's to blame. We were discussing this this afternoon. I'm not great with maths, but I'm not, I'm not taking the blame for this at all. Uh, but we will think about the situation of this elderly saint, or maybe the predicament it depends how you want to look at it. And then, uh, second of all, after we've thought about his situation, his struggle, we'll think about the response of the elderly Christian, the elderly saint. So can I, can I invite you to just to go ahead and grab a copy of Scripture, if you can, they're dotted around, or, or check on your phone for Psalm 71. Please get to the beginning of, of that Psalm, 71, and let's think about the, the, the first point there, the situation, the situation of the elderly saint. And let me tell you what we're, why we've called it that, the situation of the elderly saint, because what I think we find here in this Psalm, there are an, there's a number of issues or problems that David, the psalmist, is facing here. There's a number of problems or issues. And these are, I think, particular issues that affect those of advancing years, Christians of advancing years. So can I highlight these in the text? Let's try and look and find these in the text. Issues that he's facing as an elderly saint. The first one is this, is failing strength. There is, uh, take it from me, and you can see it in the reading, you can hear it in the reading, there's an awful lot going on 
in this psalm. And, uh, and it is quite a difficult psalm, and it's a difficult psalm to follow. I think for, for most uh, writers would, would agree is that actually verse 9 is a key uh, verse if we're going to understand this uh, psalm properly. And, and perhaps you'll allow me just to read part of that out and, and, and listen for the issue that, that David is concerned about. He, he says, do not cast me off in this time of old age. Forsake me not when my strength is spent. Now, can you, Christian friend, can you see the idea here? Who's David? David has been a colossus, hasn't he, in the, the history of Israel? He's been this great king, but now what's happened? Now in his old age, he sees something of his, his decline. And David's here, and he's in sitting with, with gray hair, and there's an element that he bemoans his deteriorating health in the psalm and his diminishing strength. And in short, if we want to sum it up, it's probably true to say that David sees that he is failing to a degree. And, and as I say that, and as we consider this psalm, perhaps, perhaps there's a familiarity to that for some of us this evening. As I am, as I pastor in the church, as Will does that, as we visit one, uh, one line that we can hear often from an elderly Christian uh, is their frustration, whether we agree with this or not, we hear it often, is a frustration from an elderly Christian at not being able to contribute to the life of the church as they once did. And whether we agree with that or, or not, that reality, that feeling can be really disconcerting for an older Christian. And why does it happen? It happens because we know that old age does not come alone, does it? Like old age brings with it a decline in strength. It can bring with it this numbing of our mental agility. We are not able to do what we were once able to do as Christians. And you see that? That is the experience of David here in the psalm. So he is failing in his strength. That's the first thing we see. The second thing that we see, though, is he is in advancing years. He's facing opposition. As an older thing, he's facing opposition. I just said a moment ago that there's lots and lots going on uh, in the psalm, and I'm not taking that back, there very much is, but I think one theme that you cannot help but have noticed is the theme of troubled relationships in this psalm, in Psalm 71. Did you pick up on that? Did you pick up on the opposition that this man is facing here? Let me just throw out some of the words he says, the phrases. He talks about wicked men. He talks about cruel opponents that he's facing. He talks about enemies. He talks about accusers. I could go on, and it is quite a list. Now, commentators uh, spend an awful lot of time trying to pinpoint what historical situation is in view there for King David. But can you see the problem with that? Throughout David's life, he faced opponents so often that that's an almost impossible task. But I do think uh, what he says in verse 11 is, is, is important. Um, verse 11. Now, do, as I read this, do, can you think about whether this seems familiar to you? Think about elsewhere in the Old Testament. Does this seem familiar? These opponents say this. They say, God has forsaken him pursue and seize him, for there is none to deliver them. Who does that sound like? Who does that sound like? Think about the elsewhere in the Old Testament. Does this not sound like Job's friends? Here, David's opponents here, they're attributing this older man's 
trial. Maybe it's, maybe it's, it's ill health. Maybe it is just deteriorating strength. Maybe it's a, a weakness. And they're attributing this to God having turned his back on this elderly saint. Maybe again this evening, for some of advancing years in this room, maybe again that seems familiar. Let me just speak to the younger people, uh, the younger Christians in the room. <laughs> uh, guys, if, uh, if you're expecting your sanctification uh, to lead to beautifully harmonious relationships in old age. If you're expecting that, then the chances are that you're in for a, a bit of a shock. What many of the older Christians in the room would surely affirm is that advancing years do not insulate us from opposition or troubled relationships. In fact, these things can actually be, be more acute for the older Christian. Why? Because they've had to endure that opposition and these troubled relationships for longer, for year after year, sometimes for decade after decade. So this man, what's happening? This older saint, he, he, he's failing uh, in his strength. He's facing opposition. And then there's just a, a third and a last one here. And he's also fearing do you see it on the screen? He's fearing abandonment, but by whom? As this older believer, he's fearing abandonment by God. By God. Now, I perhaps don't need to linger on this, but I do need to emphasize that what we come to now is his predominant concern. Let's go back to that key verse, verse 9, and you'll hear it. Just listen again. Think about his main concern here. We've said it's about strength, but what else? Listen. So he cries out to his God in old age and says, do not cast me off in this time of old age. And the idea is the same in verse 12. Then in verse 18, we read again, he cries out, even in my old age and, and gray hairs, Lord, oh God, do not forsake me. So do you see the idea? Yes, there's failing health here. Yes, there's opponents. What's his main concern? His main concern is that these things will mean a lessening for him of the sense of God's nearness in old age. He's concerned that there will be a chilling in his relationship with his God. And can that not also be a, a concern we face also in old age that perhaps may be a, a diminishing in our mental alertness, our mental faculties? Maybe that will mean a knowing less of the nearness of God that perhaps that as death even, as it approaches, there can be the worry that as death approaches that our God might seem far off. Friends, as, as we hear from David here in the psalm, aren't we so glad that the Bible does not shy away from the issues and the problems and the predicaments that come with old age? So we see the, the, the first side of this, the, the situation of the, the elderly saint. And perhaps it is the case that for some of us, this is very, very real this evening. But that, of course, takes us to the second question tonight. And, and that is, well, how does the psalmist respond? How is that set out for us? Okay, there's these situations, these predicaments, but how does the psalmist uh, respond? Now, here what I want to do is draw your attention uh, to a number of beautiful, beautiful things uh, that we can emulate and follow after uh, here. So the first of these, what does he do? The first of these is that David turns to God in the means of grace. Now, we, we all know that uh, expression, don't we, that we can't see the wood for the trees, right? So we know that one. Of, what's that other uh, expression? Uh, we didn't see it, and it was right under our nose, there's uh, any number of these expressions for the same thing. Well, it can be a bit like that when thinking about how David here responds uh, to these situations. Because I would ask you, how would you classify what it is that we're looking at tonight? 
If uh, later on somebody phones you and says, oh, what were you looking at this evening at church? What was the minister going on about uh, tonight? What would you say it is? I think probably the mo- most of us would be on the phone and say, we looked at a psalm, right? Or some of us would say, we were looking, this is a song, we were considering a song. And all of this is true and all of it's accurate, but is it not also accurate to say that essentially what Psalm 71 is, is a heartfelt prayer. Now, do you, do you see what's happening in these troubled times, these troubles and pains and all this strife concerning old age? What has David done? But he has first fallen onto his knees And in advancing years, he has prayed through all the details of this. He has taken it to God in prayer. And then can we not add to that that what he's actually done is he's turned to God in his word. Now, you see, there is an unusual feature in this psalm. It's a very unusual feature. And it's the fact that David spends so much time in the psalm quoting other psalms. I wonder if you noticed that. There's there's far too many for me to to list off and reel off just now. But he certainly quotes Psalm 22. And you see that if you have the Bible open in front of you, you see the very opening of the psalm, verse after verse after verse after verse. That whole thing is lifted and it's taken straight from Psalm 31. That's quoted verbatim. It's taken straight from Psalm 31. So do you see what David is doing in these troubles associated with advancing years, what's he done? He's turned straight to God in prayer, but he's turned to God in, his, in God's word, and he has immediately reminded himself what he knows of the goodness and the grace of God. Now, I think for all of us tonight, there's a lesson in this, because I think it's probably true that too often when trials come into our lives, it's then that we make excuses, don't we, for giving up on spiritual disciplines. I do that. I'm sure you've done it yourself. A trial comes, trouble comes, and immediately we think, oh, this is too overwhelming for me to go to God and his word. A trial comes and say, this thing is too distracting for me to pray and to pray properly. And what are we being reminded of here? That actually it's especially when these trials and difficulties come that we need to seek God in the means of grace that he has given to us. And isn't that essential also for those of advancing years in here? If I were to appeal to you, if you're an older saint at St. Peter's, it would be that old appeal. Friends, seek as a Christian to, to end, to end well. I read this line uh, earlier in the week, and you may argue it's not particularly profound or eloquent, but isn't it helpful? The writer said, (laughs) simply, old age is no time to stop reading our Bibles. Friend, go to Scripture. Be reminded of the grace and the goodness of the God that you have served and served for so long. Then a second thing, what does he do? So he turns to God in the means of grace. Second, he traces God's past faithfulness. Many of you um, were uh, at, uh, in the church here for a recent funeral we had. Um, many of you were here uh, for the funeral of our, our beloved friend, uh, Brian Chapman. And... Uh, Because of that, many of you will have seen the famous uh, red folder. Um, It was uh, discovered really after his death that Brian had been compiling the special secret of red folder. It was a documentation of his life uh, for his family. And it was this red folder with articles and and photographs where what, what Brian was doing was he was looking back and reminiscing, in a sense, over the details of his life. And maybe you can see what Psalm 71 is. Psalm 71 is King David's red folder, 
where what David is doing here, he's looking back over his life. Yes, he's reminiscing over his life, but he is recollecting God's faithfulness to him year after year after year after year. And yes, you see it in, in verse 17. Listen, he says, from my youth, God, you taught me. And yes, you see it in verse 5. He says, Lord, uh, my trust has been in you from my youth. But I think verse 6 is worth you and I pausing over. Just before I get to verse 6, a couple of weeks ago, I visited uh, Chris and Sarah McLean. I wanted to go up and get a cuddle, not from Chris or Sarah, but from Elsie. Don't take it personally, Chris. Uh, and as Catherine and I were going in, so Elsie had just got out of hospital, and uh, Catherine and I were going in, and, and Chris, diligent dad's changing Elsie, and then he does this, and then he just he takes Elsie. I was going to say you scooped Elsie up, but you didn't do that. You were, you were, she was much too fragile to be scooped. And you held, Chris held Elsie just in his arms, small, just could hold her in his arm tenderly as a father. Is that not the idea of verse 6? This older Christian saying to God, Upon you I have leaned from before my birth. You are here who took me from my mother's womb. You can see it, can't you? It's the twin ideas of election, but there's also this, this, this idea of divine care since before David knew anything about it. Before he knew anything, God was there as his strength and his, and his care since before his life. And David is saying, and through his life, at every step, God has protected him, protected him under the shadow of his wings. And, and Christian friends, and especially older Christian friends in the room, can we not do this? Can you not do this? Can you not even deliberately reminisce, recollect tonight and look back on God's faithfulness to you right throughout your experience? Listen to what God says to you from Isaiah chapter 46. This is beautiful. God says, listen to me, you who have been born by me from before your birth and carried from the womb. God says, even to your old age, I am he, and to gray hairs I will carry you. So David turns to God, but he also traces God's past faithfulness. And then the third one, God also testifies to, to uh, David testifies to God's goodness. So here we come to trouble. The third one here. Here we come to the great antithesis in that here between the views that you and I would, would encounter in Dundee in the 21st century, in the Western world, and the view that is set out in Holy Scripture, and it all revolves around the goal or the purpose of old age. Now, can I turn that over to you? You think about that. What would, what would our world say... What, would, what view would our world put forward about the goal and purpose of retirement? If you were to ask your unbelieving friends, what's the goal and the purpose of retirement? What are they going to say? Is it not the case that many of them would say it's about self, isn't it? And self, perhaps self-indulgence? Can you hear the views of our society? Perhaps people would say, well, I've struggled all the life. You know, I've, I've worked hard for all these decades. So my retirement, right, feet are going up, you know. And my retirement is going to be about vacation, holidays. It's going to be me time. That's the goal, the goal of retirement. And then you contrast that with verses 16 to 18 here. And you find something different. Because this old man, verse 16, he speaks of remind, what does he say? Reminding them. Who's the them? Reminding them of your righteousness. Then verse 17, what's old age about? 
proclaiming your wondrous deeds. Then verse 18 gives us the answer. What's that about? Proclaiming your might to another generation. So do, do, does everybody see? Does everybody see what's in view here? Here with old age comes the duty to tell younger people of the greatness of our God. In fact, there's an excitement here. In verse 18, can you feel the excitement? David is saying, Lord, please do not forsake me until I get opportunity to tell younger people of your grace. The, the, the obvious thing to say is that there is application there for, for the older saints in the room. Can, can the older Christians in here think back to their youth? Can the older Christians, can they not identify that there were older Christians for you in your youth who would put an arm around you and who would instruct you and pray for you and care for you? And you can see the application. The application is simply, and, and now it's your turn brother, now it's your turn, sister. But I think more than that, there's application here for the younger people in the life of this church. I promised, I promised you, you couldn't fall asleep if you're a younger person. You see, if you're a younger Christian at St. Peter's, I would urge you to give opportunity to the older saints to get to know you, to care for you, to teach you, and to love you. And that, that sounds maybe like a sound bite, but it's actually a very difficult thing in the life of the church. Especially when we're young, what we want to do is stick to our own age groups, don't we? We find that easier, but there needs to be intergenerational fellowship in the life of a church like St. Peter. So to the younger people, to the students and younger than that, I would urge you, even over coffee, after a service, seek out an, an older saint over a conversation or join a fellowship group. Do that where you're young and old can, can mix and mingle, but let's be a, a congregation that allows older saints to do this, that allows older Christians to pass on to us the truths of the might and the, the majesty of God. And then we close uh, with the last thing. So David is, in, in, in the, the trials of old age, he's turned to God in the means of grace. He's traced God's past faithfulness. The third thing is he's testified to God's goodness. And then the last one, which is the best of the lot, so don't miss it. David, this elderly saint, also trusts in future blessing. When you look at Psalm 71... Again, I think it's, it's difficult not to, to see the dramatic change in tone that happens through the course of this song. I wonder if you saw that. So David has moved from crying out in anguish at the start of this song to a point by the end of this song where he is crying out with wonder and joy and crying out, oh God, who is like you? And in fact, if we can look together as we close at verses 20 and 21, and if we'll just leave those up there, have a look at this. Yes, David speaks about being revived again in his advanced years, but look at verse 21. David speaks of this hope now, do you notice the language of increased greatness? Here's an older saint, perhaps towards the end of his life, speaking of this hope of increased greatness. Now, now what is he looking forward to? What is he anticipating? What, and what are the grounds for this hope of increased greatness? Well, I think, truth be told, it's difficult for a Christian to read Psalm 71 and not, by the end of the psalm, be thinking of another individual. I think it's very difficult not to be pointed by Psalm 71 uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Surely, as you read that psalm and think about that psalm, it's the same for you. And think about our Lord's experience. That, well, yes, uh, <laughs> King David's greater son, he too was beset by evil men and opposed. 
Yes, at the cross, our Lord knew this great weakening of his strength. Yes, in his trial, he too quoted, you know, Psalm 31 and Psalm 22, and, and like David in verse 7, yes, Jesus too was a portent, a symbol of woe to many, but I want you to consider what is behind my head on the screen and consider it in the experience of our Lord. Because did these things not come to actual fruition for King David's greater son? Was the Lord Jesus not actually physically, truly revived again from the depths of the earth? Was he not, look at the language, was Christ not brought up again by his heavenly Father? When you and I take that into view, I think we realize what this increased blessing is that the psalmist was looking forward to. It was the increased blessing, the greater blessing, the increased greatness of life after death. We often hear that in the Psalms, there was no hope of, of life after death in the Psalms. What nonsense, what nonsense. There is for the Psalmist here a heavenly hope. There is a joy rooted in the fact that not even death will sever this veteran believer's relationship with God. Let me say that again for the older people in the room. Not even death, the Psalmist knows, will sever this veteran believer's relationship with God. And I think we can end with a very famous verse from Romans chapter 8. For every older saint at St. Peter's, what does Paul say? And I ask you, are you feeling the real burden of advancing years? Are you struggling? Paul says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present life, they are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. What wonder. He will increase your greatness. There is for you true joy ahead, and all because of the life, death, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, let's bow our heads and let's pray.